Okay, there we go. All right. Okay, so welcome to the second lecture of quantum physics for non-physicists. So Nuri is not here today, so I will just make pauses every 10 minutes or so to see if there's any questions. And we have new improved uh, grasp of technology on my side. So for example, I have now a much nicer laser pointer. And we will start by do a quick re recap of what we did uh, yesterday, where I'll not go through the examples, but I'll just repeat the formalism once again, because it's the first time we've seen it. And then we'll talk a bit about uh, evolution of systems and a bit about, if we have time, about composing systems. Okay, but today's lesson is more to consolidate what we learned uh, on Tuesday. So uh, I also set myself up to failure by deciding that I'll do a daily metaphor about quantum physics. And this is motivated by the fact that I, I, I saw I did not properly motivate the lecture uh, last Tuesday. So I said, why you take this course or what's the difference between this course and other courses about quantum mechanics, but I, just, I didn't say much about why I would want to learn uh, quantum mechanics in the first place. And so, there's of course all the all the applications right of quantum theory uh, that you can use for sensing for quantum computing but uh, for many many uh, nanotechnologies for example and this is if you are for example an engineer at ETH this is probably uh, one of the ways that uh, you will apply the knowledge here it would be for example to work in a lab or to uh, try to do information processing for something coming out of a lab right or to develop quantum software, for example. Uh, however, I mean, this is not why I study quantum mechanics. And the reason why I study is that uh, it's still, it's a fascinating theory that we don't understand well yet, where we can already apply to so many things that have a huge impact in life, uh, but we still don't, we've not gotten to the core of it as a, as a scientific community yet. Uh, so in that sense, it's like, you know, when, when you're in love with someone and you just, the more you know them, the more you want to know them and you start accepting after a while, you forget that there was like a, a classical world before, you forget a world where things would make sense in a different way, where you don't have the, all the quirks of this person. And, and if you try to explain to your family why they're great, you, you go and say, well, you know, they're an engineer or uh, I don't know, they're really good at doing this or that, but this is not the reason why, why uh, you're in love with them. So that's, uh, that's my pitch for quantum physics is really the more you know it, the more you'll be intrigued by it and the more you'll want to learn it. And I don't think I can make you fall in love with the theory in the first week. It will take maybe two or three weeks for this. So hang on. Okay, so we'll recap a bit with what we did last week, which was looking at states and measurements. And so first we said that states, uh, systems, physical systems, which as you can see, I'm so sick. So physical systems correspond to Hilbert spaces. So let's see. And we didn't say much about what a system really is, but we gave some examples like the spin of an electron or, or the position of a photon. And we'll see later what, what systems are, right? But we don't care about this for now. So Hilbert spaces. And we looked at the continuous case and the discrete case. And for this, you need, the first thing you do when you have a Hilbert space is to pick a basis. And so let's start with a discrete, for example, we look at the qubit, but more generally could have some dimension n, and it could be, for example, the span of a basis i. Sorry. Okay. And the continuous case could be the span of, a, of something that has coefficients, for example, in r. So 
then states were elements of this Hilbert space, right? And we, we looked at Dirac notation. where you have something called ket and something called bras, where ket is just a, a representation of a vertical vector, column vector. So oh, here are the coefficients. And the bra is the transpose conjugate. So, so it's a line vector with the compose, with the conjugate element. And then any state, Oh, can be expanded in this basis, right? So we can, for a fixed, for a given basis, it can expand any state. And we saw, uh, for example, state psi could be expanded in the discrete case as all the as a sum of by these elements and the coefficients are given naturally by this inner product, right? So this is the inner product. So it's just multiplying the line vector with the column vector. So this is a number. This belongs in C. This belongs in the Hilbert space. Okay, Hilbert space normally we designate by Carly H and this obviously in the Hilbert space as well. And this, by the way, is what we call a, a superposition okay. with respect to a given basis. So in the, this, in the continuous case, you have the same thing, you just replace it with an integral. And here you have uh, x and now this inner product as we saw is what we call the wave function and we can represent it by this okay this is what we call the wave function and obviously this is a number as well so this is also in c and this is in the hilbert space but well, the whole thing is in the hilbert space Okay, and then we saw some examples of basis, which I will recap. So, we saw for the qubit case, what we call the Z basis or computational basis. Is this zero one? And this is just what I mean by zero is just this basis element. One is the other one. Okay. We saw the X basis, for example. Uh, which was plus and minus. which corresponds to uh, one over square root of two, one over square root of two, it's two there. And the other one is one over square root of two and minus one over square root of two, which is another way of saying that the first one is uh, zero plus one over square root of two, and the other one is zero minus one. We also saw the y basis where you have zero plus minus i1 and zero plus minus, uh, sorry, zero plus i1 and zero minus i1 as the basis elements. But we don't go into this and we saw that there's this representation in the block sphere, which is, and which you did in the exercise class, I think, with Maria that you can represent all the states on the surface of a sphere where here comes a zero, the one is here. And if I call this the x-axis, then I can have 
here plus Yeah, minus and sorry every day i i represent the block sphere the plus and minus will be in different places depending on how i label the axis but don't don't worry about it okay so on a line you also saw now in the continuous case we saw the position basis X, right? Which we're not going to represent as a vector because it should be infinite. The awkward. And with, I think you saw now the momentum basis. P. Where P is given by the Fourier transform. Uh, dx. Right, something like this. Uh, in all these cases, this the the so the x and the z bases are mutually unbiased, which means that the overlap. The inner product between zero and plus is the same as the over product between uh, one and plus, and it's the same as uh, zero minus, and it's the same as here. And here is the same thing. So the inner product between any x and any p is the same, uh, which means that the bases are kind of nicely rotated in relation to each other. So as you see in this case, between zero and plus is the same as between one and plus. Good. Because, of course, there could be bases that are a bit closer, right? In, in the qubit, every axis of the sphere beca can, is a valid basis. So you could have this basis here, but you should not be biased with that. Because you should have more overlap with zero than one. OK. So that's it for states. And later on, we'll look at uh, modeling uncertainty about states and looking at subsystems and several systems. But that's it for states. Then what we did was talk about projective measurements. And the summary, if you want it in a compact way, is that you can represent a measurement by a series of projectors. So let's call it P0. In this case, it's a finite. It does not need to be finite. Where what is a projector is a, an operator on the Hilbert space such that the, the square is the same. So pi square is pi. And in this case, we want them to sum up to the identity i of pi. This is, this is just the identity matrix. So in the continuous case, of course, you'd have Uh, that the integral of dx, let's call them px now. This is the identity point. Okay. Good. Let me look if there are questions. Oh, chat. Okay, no questions. Good. Okay. And then we saw some examples. We saw the example of measuring relative to a basis, where each of these projectors corresponds to just one basis element. And then we saw this more coarse grained one. I'll just put here the two examples. So, examples measure with respect to a basis. For example, in the case of the qubit, we could measure. In the z basis, and this would correspond to the projectors being just a zero element, just one, or this coarse grained one, for example. Position. This was this case where there was. Oops. 
focus and there was here x1 and here x2 and we just set a measurement that asks are we inside this box or are we to the left or are we to the right so this was a measurement corresponding our three projectors p0 p1 and p2 such that p0 was everything from minus infinity to x1 position right so this is a sum is a coarse graining of, of all the various elements into there and p1 was the sum from x1 to x2 and p2 was the sum from x2 to plus infinity right take x x x and then what's important here is well this is how we represent it. This is, these are the, the mathematical objects. How do they relate to reality? So how do they relate, for example, to the probability of getting a given outcome and to the state after the outcome, after the measurement? Right. And then we saw that the, the probability of getting outcome, some outcome i, was uh, given by p. We can represent it like this, for example, probability of i for a state psi. Uh, it's not too important how we represent it, and this was given by psi by i psi, which in the case of in the case of measurement with respect to a basis. This became uh, much simpler. This became the, so it should be psi, for example. And here comes the basis element. So I, I, psi. And again, remember, these are just the vectors that we are multiplying. The notation is not that uh, rigorous. Check. Check. These are two numbers. These are two complex numbers. And so this is the same as that, which was the rule I first gave you because we started with a simple example before generalizing. Okay, and the post measurement state. Measurement state. After we got the outcome I, this was just uh, given by the projector I psi over the probability of getting this. Let's just write over the probability of getting I psi. So that's P I psi. And this probability in the denominator is just to normalize the state again. So, so I, so there you go. Okay, and of course, look, this, again, this is a number. This is a, a vector in the Hilbert space actor with a matrix, so it's, it's still a vector. Okay, so the whole thing still a vector. Okay, so that was measurements. And then I said that we can represent measurements as observables. And this is used a lot in the continuous case and it's used a lot in traditional courses of quantum mechanics. Ah, let me try to remove the mouse. There we go. So, uh, we can so we can represent uh, measurements as observables 
And this is really just a representation for us, right? So we had a measurement. It was represented by some P1, some projectors. And now we can have labels, lambda 1, lambda 2, blah, 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 blah. Labels, OK, which have no physical meaning. This is just, uh, for example, it could be 1 centimeter, 2 centimeters, 3 centimeters, or spin up, spin down. It's, it's words that we put on it, OK? And then the observable is it just an operator, again, that acts on the Hilbert space, which is just the projectors weighed by these uh, by this, uh, labels. So, and of course, uh, in this case, we can have projectors is I'm muted, okay, I'm back. Okay, sorry, so this was a VPN connection that died, of course. Uh, what was the last thing you heard? Jonathan, for example? Okay, about labels, okay, yes, so. Okay, so these are labels that we give to the measurement outcomes, which are usually numbers. The observable then is, a, is an operator that has just the projectors weighed by these labels. Okay, so these labels are the, turn out to be the eigenvalues of O. And this is just another way to represent a measurement, which is useful for some things. So useful for, it's useful for computing some things, for example, uh, the average. So for example, I'm measuring the, the position and I'll ask what's the average position. This is something that came up in the exercise sheet this week. And this would be just psi. Oh. Psi, and you can see that this is the that this is indeed an average because because this is just, well, let's put the phi say outside first, lambda i, pi, psi, and this is just sum of i, lambda i, right. And this is the probability, so, this thing here is the probability of getting the outcome i and then weighed by the, the value that you assign to this outcome. There you go. And the other thing that will be used a lot later will be the variance. And that is uh, total square. That's The average of O squared minus the average of O squared. And that's just, so psi, then you have this O squared, which is just taking this matrix up here, right? And multiplying by itself and putting it inside there. We'll see many examples of this. That's why I'm not doing this now. And here, the thing we did before just the square itself. So it's used for this a lot. So that's it for now for measurements. Later on, we'll see how to go beyond physical, uh, beyond projective measurements, and uh, to see measurements that have uh, more noise, for example, or that have a strange effect on the state at the end. And we'll also look at how we actually do the physical implementation of, of measurements. Okay. There's just one more thing I wanted to say, which was this idea that the global phase does not matter. So,
it as we'll see later it's a bit misleading but for practical purposes it works for when you have very isolated systems and the idea is that so suppose you have two, two states so suppose you have a state phi that is the same as psi just rotated by some phase alpha okay and now we want to know some probability of getting some outcome on the same measurement okay so it would be psi I, psi and i would just replace here so this is uh, so phi I minus phi alpha pi this is much nicer I'm doing it on the whiteboard. And here E I alpha psi. Okay, and now these numbers, these are just numbers, so we can move them out. So we have E I alpha minus alpha, that's just one, and then we left with just psi pi i psi. Okay, so that's just one. So, which means that this global phase did not matter for for the outcome, for um, for the probabilities of getting different outcomes. So, it's not operational if we are only considering a single system. As we'll see later, this will change when we have several systems. Okay, so that was just a recap. And now we'll start talking about evolution of physical systems, and I'll give some examples. So, oh. and so we will talk first about the reversible of evolution. And later on, we'll see that irreversible of evolution is just, in fact, a reversible evolution where, for some reason, we are losing out on some information. So maybe it's reversible in a in a larger system, and we're only looking at a subsystem. Okay, we'll, we'll see this later. So we start by talking about reversible. Which means that we want something that acts on states and returns states. And if states are vectors, this means that we want uh, something that acts like a matrix. Because as we'll see, to be kind of, everything is linear. It's beautiful. Uh, and we want, so we want a matrix that can be reversed. Okay, which means it's a matrix such that there exists something else that uh, when multiplied together, which means when we apply one and then the other, you get the identity. Okay, and in our case, what we look at is unitary matrices. Okay, so unitary operators. So these are the ones such that if you have the transpose conjugate and multiply it by it, the transpose conjugate, the U dagger, acts like the like like uh, like reverting what you had. So when you multiply it, multiply it again, nothing happens. Okay. That's the idea. So this is the kind of operators that we'll, we will. Uh, govern our evolution of physical systems. So I will start with some examples. And today we'll see all the examples in discrete systems in qubits. And to give you interesting examples in the, in the Cotillas case, we'll need to talk a bit more about, uh, well, about the formalism before going there. So let's just look at here at the so-called polymatrices, they are used a lot in quantum computing, for example. So these are three matrices. Y. Is I, I. And Z equals still zero. Okay. Give up. Okay, uh, so let's see what they do right away. So let's see what happens when you add with this matrix x on a state zero. 
And in the beginning, it's useful to go to the matrix form. So it's a 0, 1, 1, 0. And state 0, as we saw, is this. And this returns, so if you can multiply matrices, you'll see it gives you this state, which is state 1. And similarly, if you apply the same matrix to 1, Uh, zero, you get state zero. So this is what we call the bit flip. If you think of, of this qubit as encoding a bit zero or one, what this x does is to flip it. Okay. So now let's see how we type to the other state, for example, the plus. And I don't want to write it in matrix form anymore. I want to stay in this DR notation. So I'll just expand plus. I know what plus is. So this is x acting on 0 plus 1 over square root of 2. And that's x0 plus x acting on 1 because it's a matrix, everything is linear there. And x times 0, we know that's 1. And x times 1, we know that's 0. So we'll return at the same state as we started with. This is state plus. Similar, you can see that x acting on minus, this will give you x acting on okay, so it's 0 minus 1 over square root of 2 and now you can just see what will happen when you have x with 0 this is 1 and x with 1 is minus 0 so you just get the phase factor so this will be uh, minus 0 plus 1 over square root of 2 which is minus okay so this means that plus and minus are the are the eigen are the eigen vectors of this matrix with the eigenvalues plus one and minus one. This will be useful later. If you draw this in the block sphere, remember here it was a zero, and there it was the one, and it flipped one to the other without moving the plus and minus, uh, sorry, without giving only a global phase, which is not represented in the ball sphere, remember. So what this corresponds to is a, is a rotation of pi over the x axis. Okay, so you just, you just turn the ball sphere like this. So if a state was here, then it will go to yeah, somewhere there. Uh, You'll see. Uh, so what? Yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't change the x component; only changes the here. Only changes uh, the z component. Good. So this is why sometimes you you'll hear calling um, evolutions rotations is because there are things that you can undo. Ah. So, similarly, we will not waste much time on this, but the, um, the gate Z at, uh, in the following way, the, the poly X acts like this. So if you have the Z in zero, this is the matrix, so it was zero, one minus one, zero, zero, acting on state one, zero, does nothing, okay, one, zero, so it returns the same, but the exact acting on one, it just gives it a, a minus phase, 
Okay, so it's so minus vector one. Okay, so this is what we call a phase flip. And if you do the maths, you can see. I'll give I'll give you this as an exercise, but if you apply it to the plus, you get minus. And if you apply it to minus, you get plus. And let me do so this and this corresponds in the block sphere, it will correspond to a a rotation around the around the x uh, around the z axis so it maps these two states the plus and the minus to each other okay so far i know that i'm just talking about a unitary applying and this has nothing to do with actual dynamics with what actually happens in, in time when you evolve something in time and that will come later that will come next week but first i need to give you like the just the the root thing before going into more detail. So that was page four. And page five will be here somewhere. It's one and three. Good. And in, in all of these cases, it turns out that the the reverse of the matrix is the matrix itself. So in all of these cases, we have that X dagger is X itself. You can see by looking at it. So if you take the transpose, the conjugate does nothing because they're real numbers and the transpose also leaves it the same. Okay. And indeed, x, x star is the same as x, x itself. And if you multiply the two matrices, you get the identity. And it's the same for y and the same for z. Okay. So this means that they are, uh, they are not only unitary matrices, but uh, but the whole yes, but the these matrices are also used as observables. Okay, and this can be a bit confused, so I'll write here a note. Now we we're really talking about uh, the evolution. This is a thing that matters to us. But these matrices, the poly matrices, are also uh, used to represent observables. So, and what would this be? For example, if you take the set, the measurement would be zero, zero, and one, one. And the labels would be uh, sorry, one minus one. These are the labels. Okay, so and Z is exactly so one times zero zero minus one times one one. Okay, so it can be used to represent a measurement in the Z basis, in the computational basis, with with the labels corresponding to the outcomes being one and minus one, okay? Which is, again, the labels don't mean anything. It could also be zero and one, for example. And sometimes we talk about outcome zero where it's obvious that we mean the state zero. And the same for X equals plus, as we saw that these were the, eigenve the eigenvectors. Check, okay, which is again, these are the projectors. These are the projectors. And the, the eigenvalues, the labels are plus one and minus one. Okay, so these things can be used as observables. Don't be confused when it shows up like this later on. Okay, and I wanted to give one more gate and talk about one application, and we we'll leave the composition of systems to next time. So one more gate that is also used a lot is the Hadamard gate. which is very useful because it changes between the two bases, between X and Z, and is used to create superpositions, for example. So H is one over square root of two of 
one, 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 minus one. Okay. So if you act with this, on state zero, you get, oh, can I do that? Copy, paste, that took longer than actually writing it, but uh, then I forgot that. So you get one over square root of two of one, one, which is your state plus, okay? Similarly, we can see later that applying on the one, you get minus, applying on plus, you get zero, and applying on minus, you get one. So it can be used to change basis. And now let's just connect with the other things we did before. And I'll go a little bit over time because we started one minute later or so. But it's just to show you this fun thing and then, and then we'll stop there. And it's how to apply this to, it's a, a fun application to measurements. Okay, so, which is actually used in, in quantum computation, for example. And the idea is that uh, physically, maybe measuring in a different basis can be hard to implement. Right? You have a system that is something like, I apply this one laser and I count how many photons come out in a given frequency, and this is how I work out the outcome of my measurement, okay? And this works for a measurement in this specific basis, okay? And doing a measurement in a different basis would be much harder to implement. So what you can do is instead of measuring directly in a different basis, we apply for a rotation to change basis, and then we measure in the original basis, the easy one. And one way to see this here, for example, is to say, is to look that, uh, if you have Z and we conjugate it with Hadamard, what happens here? So let's see. So we have H, Z, as we saw before, is this 0, 0, minus 1, 1. You can write it like this, H, K. And now everything is linear. H, 0, 0, H, minus H, 1, 1, H. Okay, and now h applied to zero is plus, and the same here, minus, h applied to one and minus. But now what we have here is just a matrix x, right? So in particular, uh, if you want to do a measurement measurement in the x basis, you can replace it, replace it with first we evolve with Hadamard and then measure z. And to see, first I'll represent this in a quantum circuit. So the way we represent things in a circuit is, well, here comes the initial qubit and time goes from left to right. That's I apply the Hadamard, and then this is like, if you look at it, it looks a bit like a pointer. So this means a measurement. And it always means a measurement in a Z basis. In quantum computing, in abstract, when you design algorithms, etc., you will always write the measurement in the Z basis. So what you need to see that, to see that this works is that the probabilities are the same and that the post-measurement state is the same, okay? So I'll do just the probabilities, just to make sure that you got it right. So the probability of getting plus with psi, this is psi plus plus psi. And now I just replace here the plus with, so I leave the psi alone and I leave here, well, plus is just a Hadamard applied to zero. Right? Which means that this is the same as FA. 
my original state being the psi, and then I apply the Hadamard. Now I measured for the outcome zero, and then I got the state. Check, check. It's just having the same on the other side. Which is exactly what's represented here because here you have you have the original stage, then you apply the Hadamard, and then we measure, and now we're considering just the projector into outcomes here. Okay. So this is one application of how to combine the the unitary evolutions with measurements that is actually used in real life. Okay. So we'll stop here and now next week we'll see how to do composing systems and then we'll talk about actual physical evolution. So dynamics over time and we'll talk about the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so thank you and see you next week. Ciao.